Hi, this is Pastor Darrell Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Monday, March 14th, 2016. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Hope you guys had a great weekend. I hope nobody was late for appointments because of the whole set your clock ahead an hour thing. Anyway, let's get right into it and have a look at some things going on today that tend to point toward Bible prophecy. Out of Reuters, North Korea's Kim Jong-un says country has miniaturized nuclear warheads. Now, understand something. North Korea was pretty much allowed to march forward pursuing their nuclear ambitions, much in the same way Iran is now given this same freedom. And here's North Korea threatening the world with nuclear bombs. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un said his country has miniaturized nuclear warheads to mount on ballistic missiles and ordered improvements in the power and precision of its arsenal, state media reported last week. He's called for his military to be prepared to mount preemptive attacks against the United States and South Korea and stand ready to use nuclear weapons, stepping up belligerent rhetoric after coming under new UN and bilateral sanctions last week for its nuclear and rocket tests. Iran is also conducting nuclear and rocket tests. Iran has been given $150 billion and a green light to go ahead with their nuclear ambitions. And our Muslim president and John Kerry and most of the world seem to think this is okay and it's a good thing. But soon we'll wake up to news of Iran launches nuclear weapon against Saudi Arabia and Israel and the United States. And then what? Is everyone going to blame Obama at that point, or will they blame the current president at that time? Interesting to watch. Very interesting to watch. Out of time.com, North Korea says its hydrogen bomb could wipe out Manhattan. <clears throat> wipe out Manhattan. North Korea yesterday said it could kill everyone in Manhattan and burn the city down to ashes by mounting a hydrogen bomb on a ballistic missile. This came from North Korea state-run media DPRK Today. He said, this, this nuclear scientist said, our hydrogen bomb is much bigger than the one developed by the Soviet Union. If this H-bomb were to be mounted on an intercontinental ballistic missile and fall on Manhattan in New York City, all the people there would be killed immediately and the city would be burned down to ashes. Yay, nuclear threats. <laughs> Keep in mind, the Bible tells us no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Now, they might take out <clears throat> a city, they might take out some buildings, but they can never take us out of God's hands. They can never take the love of God out of our hearts. They can do no more than harm the body. The Bible says, do not fear the one who can kill the body and then do no more, but rather fear the one who, after the body is dead, can cast the soul into hell. That would be God. See, the Bible tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. <clears throat> so it looks like Israel and Hamas are at it again. Hamas has vowed to strike Israel for retaliating. See, here's what happened. Hamas launched a few rockets into Israel. Okay, Israel responded, said, uh, no, you don't. Took out several places. And then Hamas gets all angry that Israel responded. It's like if you were to punch somebody in the face and you turn around and get angry when they hit you back. <laughs> um, it's your fault, not theirs. Out of the Washington Post, Israel retaliates for Gaza rocket fire with airstrikes. Hamas hacks Israeli TV. Israel and Islamist militants in Gaza exchange escalating threats and rocket fire over the weekend as an Israeli retaliatory airstrike hit the coastal enclave. So it looks like they're at it again. Israel has said, you know what? We will not respond with light force. We will respond with appropriate force. You want to launch rockets at us? We're going to take you out. So don't launch rockets at us. You know, that's pretty much the simple peaceful answer. But understand the Palestinians, the Muslims don't want peace with Israel. They want to kill all the Jews. They want to wipe Israel out. They want to drive the Jews into the sea. They want to take all of the land of Israel and make it into all of the land of Palestine. That's their goal. Out of Israel National News, Hamas vows retaliation for Israeli Gaza airstrike. This is funny because 
the Israeli Gaza airstrike came in response to the Hamas rockets being launched into Israel. But Hamas is like, we will retaliate since you launched rockets into us. Well, Israel was retaliating from Hamas rockets. The world needs to understand, Hamas launched the first rockets. Israel responded as well they should. And now Hamas is angry that they responded. That's, that's just, it's bizarre to me. But that's the way these people operate. Uh, every time I hear stories like this, I think of the birth of Muhammad in, uh, not Muhammad, ooh, Freudian slip, the birth of um, <laughs> Ishmael. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm uh, closer to the truth than we realize. In Genesis 16, verse 12, it says, He'll be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. This was the birth of Ishmael. He'll be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. Basically saying, yeah, you're not going to live in peace. And we see this characteristic trait from Ishmael handed down to most of the Muslims living in the Middle East because they're not living in peace. Their hand is against everyone and everyone's hand against them. They kill people for not following after their twisted agenda. They think it's okay to lie. They think when they're raping a non-believer that they're actually worshiping their God. Let me ask you something. What kind of God requires brutal rape in order to worship them? That sound like the true God, the one God? No, that would sound more like something Satan would require. Out of Israel National News, John Kerry says two-state solution requires a global push. He's trying to get the whole world to come against Israel. To say, hey, you need to give up this land for peace. Because, you know, obviously land for peace works. I mean, look at the example of the Sinai or the Gaza. Clearly, Israel giving up those areas has caused peace in those areas, right? Yeah, no. Uh, being sarcastic there. There has been no peace coming from the land that Israel gave up. Israel kept their end of the bargain by giving up the land, but the other side didn't keep their end of the bargain by giving peace. You think it'll work now? There's no way it'll work now. Anyone who thinks the two-state solution is a good thing is either deceived or is a deceiver. Because forcing Israel to give up more land in a way that they could no longer defend themselves is not a good thing. But then I have to hesitate and wonder, is this God's plan for Israel's land to be so divided that they can't defend themselves so that the glory and the honor will only go to God when Israel is defended by the hand of God? When God says, yeah, you need to stop leaning upon your, your incredible military and your great technological advancements and your, your military know-how, you need to lean on me. Could the two-state solution be part of God's plan so that God can get the glory for defending Israel? You see, that's, that's where I get a little, um, not really confused, but I don't want to pray against God's will. And there's a lot of things, I think, that while we think are going to be bad, God is going to use for his good. And that could be one of them. And I'm not saying that's 100% correct. I'm on a learning journey. Uh, this is a process. Life is a process. This battlefield called planet Earth, where this battle of good versus evil is raging, will come to a final conclusion when Christ returns. Which side are you going to be on? Are you going to be on the winning side or are you going to be on the losing side? Let me tell you, Christ is victorious, just so you know which team you want to be on. Um, it's interesting watching this happen. Here, one of my favorite kind of stories. Out of the Gospel Herald, thousands of Muslims embracing Christ in Syria after witnessing miraculous healings and answered prayers. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. An unprecedented number of Muslims living in war-torn country of Syria are embracing Christianity after experiencing the love of missionaries and witnessing miraculous healings in the name of Christ. You see, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. But sometimes that light helps lead people out of the darkness. They follow after the light that is Jesus Christ. There's so many people coming to Christ because they see the love, they see the mercy, they see the forgiveness in Christ. 
that they don't experience in Islam. There is no love in Islam. When a dad can kill his own son or his own daughter because they follow the truth of Christ, that's not love. When a man kills his own wife for reading a Bible, that's not love. When they chop off the hands of a thief, that's not forgiveness. When they force someone to convert or die, that's not mercy. You see, they're following after a God who has no love, no forgiveness, no mercy. That's why when they see the examples of Christ, when they see the love and the mercy and the joy and the peace and the forgiveness that only Jesus can bring, they can't help but want that. That's why we need to pray for the lost, those who are in the darkness, who don't know the truth of Jesus Christ. I love these stories, uh, Christian Aid Mission. Despite the dangers remaining in the country, many others faithfully serve predominantly Muslim communities, providing medical care, shelter, food, and spiritual guidance for those in need. How amazing these people that are answering the calling of God in their lives, going to these Muslim dominant areas and preaching Christ and Him crucified is the only way to God the Father. Not only is that brave, that's bold. That's very bold. I pray that God will give us that kind of strength, that kind of wisdom, that kind of boldness to do the same thing. Hmm. Let's get into the word a little bit. In Psalm 115, verse 9. Psalm 115, verse 9. It says, O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Israel, trust in the Lord. Not the IDF. Not your IAF. Not the Mossad. Not the Knesset, you know, the Israeli Defense Force is one of the strongest armies in the world. They have all these missions. They win battlegrounds against all odds. The IDF has surprised the world in several times. I think for a long time they relied upon their own strength. They had a couple of battles you might be very familiar with in 1967. What is known as the Six-Day War. They were responding to a threat from the Arab world, Israel's military reacted swiftly and quite strongly. The whole war was won in less than a week. Of course, Israel felt this, this pride, this, this amazing awe toward their military. Maybe a little too much pride. After that six-day war, their slogan was all the honor to the Israel Defense Forces. Really? Now, sure, the IDF, I'm sure, deserve credit, but did they give God enough credit? Because Scripture tells us in Deuteronomy 20, verse 4, that God is the one who goes with you to fight for you. See, all of Israel's battles are actually won and fought by God. The Yom Kippur War in 1973, a little different. That war was unexpected. I think the army might have been a little unprepared at the time. Syria attacked and they seriously outnumbered Israel. Uh, there was a, a battle fought in a place called the Valley of Tears because of the loss of life and the, the fierce fighting that took place there. It happened overnight. The Syrians had over a thousand tanks. They had night vision technology. Israel had less than 200 tanks, and none of them had night vision. They were outnumbered. They were out-equipped. But guess who won? See, I think God performs great miracles, and even though Israel suffered heavy losses, they won. They defeated their enemies. I think battles like this are one of the main reasons that Israel's motto changed after that war. It soon became, Israel trusts in God. <laughs> um... Psalm 115, all you Israelites, trust in the Lord. He's their help, their shield. Everyone knew that God was behind this miracle. It was no accident this war began on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year for the Jewish people. They spent that day in prayer and fasting. Those are the real weapons. 
that win wars, prayer and fasting. Some 3,000 years ago, little David went out to fight that massive giant Goliath. He said, you come against me with a spear, a sword, a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord, 1 Samuel 17, verse 45. And then, against all odds, David went on to slay that mighty giant. So, ever since then, Israel's source of strength, their source of protection, and ours, is God Almighty. Do you trust him? Or do you lean upon your own strength? In Joel 2, verse 32, Joel 2, 32 says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. In Mark 3, Mark 3, starting in verse 28, and this is Jesus talking. He says, Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Romans 8, 38 pretty much assures us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. The Bible tells us to forgive others when they do us wrong and to seek forgiveness when we do others wrong. We have to follow after this same example that God sets and extends us this ultimate forgiveness, the forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ. Forgiveness isn't based on the depth of our sin, but it's based on the, the magnitude of the forgiver's love, okay? I mean, no sin is too great for God's complete and unconditional love. The Bible says there's only one sin that's unforgivable, and that's blaspheme of the Holy Spirit, denying God. This this attitude of a defiant hostility toward God that prevents us from being able to accept his forgiveness. Those who don't want his forgiveness are out of his reach. God's not going to force anyone to love him. He gives us free will. If you freely reject God, then don't be disappointed when he freely rejects you when you stand before him. We need to forgive others as we ask God to forgive us. In Hebrews 12, Verse 15, Hebrews 12, verse 15 says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. This root of bitterness. How can you get rid of this root of bitterness? Maybe somebody did you wrong and you're, you're still holding on to it. Or maybe you've not forgotten what that friend did or that spouse did or or the one you love or somebody close to you and you still kind of hang on to it there's some things we can do to start the healing process in our hearts and our lives first we need to admit the bitterness to god bring it to the cross confess it to god god i'm i'm holding on to this thing help me let go ask god to heal your hurt to restore your spirit to pour out his grace upon you ask god to help you Fully forgive those who have done you wrong, who have hurt you. See, forgiveness isn't just a, a gift that we give to others. It's a gift we give ourselves. Because when you forgive, the experience that you feel, this, this freedom to love, to trust, and to begin living according to God's will for your life, that's a gift we give not only to others, but to ourselves. You see, because the Christian life is more of a battleground. It's not a playground. There's so many people who think, oh, when I come to Christ, life's going to be easy. Everything's going to be roses. I'll never have another problem for the rest of my life. <laughs> well, that sounds all well and good. That's not the case. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I've already overcome the world. You know, maybe you feel like you don't feel God's presence in your life. I remember when I was a kid and I came to Christ at the age of seven, the joy that filled me. I was jumping around and running around. I remember getting into the car that night. I kind of did a flip as I landed into the back seat of the 
1971 Oldsmobile we were in. Uh, a giant car. It looked like a city block long, like a land boat. Um, but I remember that feeling, that, that joy that I couldn't contain. And it was such an innocent time of my life. I didn't have the sinful thoughts in my mind that try to invade me now. And then times where you're like, where'd that feeling go? Where'd it go? You know, these, these are trials that come into our lives. The trials it can be like the clouds that obscure the sun. You know, even though you go outside on a cloudy day and you think, well, the sun's not shining, but the sun is shining. It's still there. It's just being obscured by these clouds. I think in the same way, when you don't feel the presence of God, he is still there. Just because you don't feel it, just because you don't see it, he hadn't forgotten you, he hasn't left you or forsaken you or abandoned you. When David spoke about Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear, for thou art with me. Even when you don't feel it, God is there. Even when you don't sense his presence, he's there. He knows you. He loves you. He watches over you. Um... Trials come our way. It's, it's part of life. There are times when we feel the presence of God way stronger than other times. Not unusual. You know, trials and storms come into our life to help us grow spiritually, to help us mature in the Lord. You know, James uh, spoke in, in James 1 verses, um, where is that? James. James 1. Um... <laughs> Hang on, verses two through four. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have her perfect way, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Wanting nothing. You know, it's like getting into shape. If you want to get stronger, you got to work out. There's no other way to do it. You have to discipline yourself to go to the gym, to lift weights, get some cardio, to eat right. You know, the first time you might work out, it probably feels pretty good until the next day. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, this is killing me. I can't move. I can't walk. You can't even lift your toothbrush to brush your teeth. But then the next time, those weights feel a lot heavier than they did the first time. Everything is difficult, but you get through it. You work through it. And with the passing of time, it starts to hurt less and less and actually starts to feel pretty good. And you start adding more weight and you find the strength is coming. It it didn't happen overnight, but you grow stronger. That's what it's like to go through trials. It hurts. It's painful. It's not something we all desire. But you come out a little tougher, a little stronger, a little more mature, and a little more leaning upon God and less on yourself. Maybe you've learned a few things. Then you go through another one. You come out stronger, more mature. This happens again and again in our lives. It strengthens us. It increases our ability to stand against trials and tribulation and temptations. I mean, God's going to do some great things in our life, but we have to go through the valleys first to get to the mountaintops, right? In Isaiah, God said, I'll give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places so that you may know that I am the Lord. Hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places. Maybe you're going through a dark time. There are treasures that will come to your life through this. Just look at God's word. Christian life's not a battleground, it's a playground, or not a playground, it's a battleground. Um, we do have to go through hardships and endure things. James tells us, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord promised to those who love him. James 1 verse 12. Temptation is going to do one of two things. Either you're going to let go of God and you're going to go down in flames, or you're going to hold on to God even tighter. Grab onto him like a drowning man will grab on uh, to a life preserver thrown their way. In the same way, we have to hold on to God or we fall away. We can't lean upon our own strength. You know, temptation actually serves a purpose. It's something of a screening process. It determines who the true believers are. Now, I'm not saying that if you're a true believer, you're not going to fall into temptation because we're all guilty. We're all sinners. We've all fallen into it. But if you are a true believer, you want to you wanna get up again when you stumble. And in order to do that, you have to repent and confess and ask God for forgiveness so you can keep walking with God and learn from your mistakes because that's what we do. 
What is your heart's desire? In John 16, John 16, um, starting in verse 23, and again, this is Jesus talking. He says, And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily I say unto you, whose, Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. Now, if I said, okay, name what is the desire of your heart, what would you come up with? I mean, how long would it take you to give this genuine, heartfelt explanation of what your heart desires? I mean, don't misunderstand. All of us have these, these things that we want in our lives, right? New house, new car, big screen TV, you know, whatever it is, a promotion at work, uh, the latest technological gadget, you know, things that we want are added to and removed from our want list every day. Our wants are usually dictated by those around us, you know. Maybe you see a new friend get a new car or one of your friends get a new car and then all of a sudden you have new car fever, you know, even though you have a perfectly fine car sitting in the driveway. I think our wants change over time, but what about our true desires? I mean, what do you really desire? You ever taken the time to stop and meditate on this? I mean, I think, truly, I, <laughs> I think one of my greatest desires is to hear those words from Christ when he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That would be one of my greatest desires, or to see the kingdom of God, or to see the lies burned up and the truth made known. That's the kind of desire I'm talking about. Um... So, knowing or not knowing what we truly desire can tend to lead us to offer up prayers for random things rather than the genuine heartfelt desires that we seek. You know, sometimes God answers these prayers. Other times, maybe he protects us from our own foolishness and says, no, you know, I'm not going to let you win the lottery because it would ruin you. It would cause you to wander away from me. It would cause you to stray. It would cause you to become the prodigal son, and you don't have that much time, maybe. Um, we need to understand our prayers don't go unanswered. I mean, God typically only has three possible answers for prayer. Yes, no, and not right now. So maybe go to the Lord and and talk to him about your heartfelt desire, those things you truly want, the things you truly seek. 1 John 4:14 4, tells us the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. You know, Christ didn't come down to the earth without the Father's permission, without God's authority, without his consent, without him assisting him. He was sent of the Father that he might be the Savior of the world. I think a lot of people forget that. Um, there are distinctions as to the persons of the Holy Trinity, but there's no distinctions of honor. You see, I know people a lot of times give the honor of our salvation to Jesus more than we do God the Father. Um, I mean, what if when Jesus came, didn't the Father send him? I mean, the words that Jesus spoke, didn't the Father give him those words? Didn't he say, I will put my words in his mouth? that he might be able to minister this new covenant to us? He who knows the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost as he should know them never puts one above another in love. We see them at Bethlehem, at Gethsemane, and on Calvary, all equally engaged in the work of salvation, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. These three are one, 1 John 5, 7, and the King James tells us. So... We need to thank God the Father, thank God the Son, thank God the Holy Spirit. One God operating in three persons. You know, we're made in God's image. We have body, mind, and spirit also in the same way that God is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So we need to thank the Lord because it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, the Bible says. Trust Jesus for your salvation, but thank God that he sent the Son and asked the Holy Spirit to guide you. 
Mark 14, 36, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. God was referred to as our Father in the Old Testament, but Jesus used this title, and it brought a whole new understanding of our relationship with God. Jesus referred to God as his Father, and he spoke of God as being our Father as well. Now, this, this infuriated the religious Jews of Jesus' day, the Pharisees, the scribes, who considered it blasphemy to call God their Father because they understood that that meant they were equal with God. See, we're instructed to call God our Father, this, this kind gentle, loving nature of God, this term Abba, it's an affectionate term. You know, something like a, a kids when they refer to their dads here on earth. Dad, it's this term used to express intimacy and this, this affectionate fondness, this love we have to our dads, Abba. Okay, it, it removes the idea of God as this, this strict judge, this condemning, you know, kind of God. It carries the image of of God as a loving Father who cares, who loves us, who understands us, and is our friend. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, 1 John 3, verse 1. We're sons of God by adoption. We're joint heirs with Christ. You know, Jesus was the Son of God by nature. He was God in flesh. Jesus said to the Jews, you're of your father the devil, in John 8, 44, Ephesians 2, verse 3. But Jesus purchased us, and he made us adopted sons of God. We're not just heirs, we're joint heirs with Christ. What belongs to Christ belongs to us. The Bible says when we see Christ, we're going to see him as he is, and we're going to be like him. We're going to be like Christ. Not in this flesh, but in our resurrected bodies. To think that we share equally with the one who has inherited everything God is and God has, that goes beyond anything I can comprehend. <laughs> To think that what Christ has belongs to me too, belongs to you. That's an amazing promise that I look forward to. And it really makes my heart desire. And it really helps you get down to what is your true heart's desire. Not just your wants, but what do you really desire? I desire to see Jesus. I desire to serve him with all I am, with all that I have. Yet I fail him every day. I pray God will strengthen us. I pray that he'll guide us. I pray that he'll lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the glory and the honor forever and ever. Amen. I love you guys. Good Lord willing, I'll see you again tomorrow.